Did you know that New Westminster has been a multicultural city right from its beginnings? In this episode, you'll learn about the waves of people who have come from all over the world over the years, and something of their lives and their challenges. Historian and City Councillor Jamie McAvoy tells about the fascinating and sometimes difficult stories of these people throughout our history. Okay, Jamie, so we're just kind of doing an overview of, of uh, the story of, of the various uh, uh, people that have come to New West. And I thought maybe to start just like a thumbnail overview of uh, the story before the settlers came, because I guess this area was partially settled or temporarily settled from time to time by, with the, by the Aboriginal peoples. Yeah, I, we know that there's been uh, Aboriginal people in New West probably for thousands of years. And the reason we know that is because of archaeological relics that have come out of the Brunette Creek area. Those are now at the Royal BC Museum and people can ask to see them if they like. So we know that. And we, the first sort of recorded contact that we know is specific to New Westminster is uh, Simon Fraser, uh, when he did his explorations, he wrote about encountering some local native people on both sides of the river. Um, managed to get himself in trouble and had to get back in his canoes and take off, um, offend, offending the local sentiments. But he met a chief who's called Chief Watokinam, and Watokinam uh, and Simon Fraser met. Uh, and it seemed Watokinam already knew a fair bit about Europeans because Simon Fraser said that he had warned people, you know, don't get violent with these people. There's a lot of them, they'll come in great numbers. And so so there was some kind of knowledge that existed. Um, and then of course there was the fur trade. Aha, uh -huh. was it the sappers that were the first people that came to kind of look and settle this area? Can you explain that? Yep, it was the sappers. They came in 1858. Um, it's a simple story. There, a gold rush broke out in BC. Um, the European authorities, there were about 200 Europeans in the entire province, and there were about 10,000 Americans, our first wave of immigrants, or about 10,000 people came from California up the river in 1858. Um, and that created real fear that uh, British Columbia was going to be lost to the Americans, which is essentially what they had been doing. They would move west, settle, and then declare that piece of land to be part of the United States. So um, there was a common interest in British Columbia, both among First Nations people, uh, but especially the British colony uh, to prevent the Americans from establishing here too much. So there was a, a, quite a project to get uh, people that uh, were not American here. And I do recall something about the governor at the time um, invited a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, black uh, indentured servants or whatever from California to come up. Yeah, about, uh, about two years before British Columbia was founded, the United States had the Dred Scott decision in the Supreme Court, which essentially ruled that free black people were not full citizens of the United States. Um, and so that really prompted people to move, to move west, and ultimately some people to move to British Columbia. Um, and Governor Douglas, who, who was probably, who, who, who was part black, Governor Douglas thought that black people from the United States would be the best way to resist any takeover uh, from Americans coming into the province because black people had no interest in being a part of the United States. And so the Victoria Rifles were formed. Uh, about 200 people in the Victoria Rifles of the first military regiment in British Columbia made up entirely of black people uh, who came through California. And was there any kind of movement of those that group of people to the New West area at that point? Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually one of the hardest bits to figure out in terms of ways of migration and ethnicity because there was no particular place in New Westminster. Um, you can't tell by somebody's name, um, but 
we actually know, um, there's a little note. There was a, a man born in 1860 in New Westminster, and there's actually a photograph of him at the library. Um, and it says, first white man born in New Westminster. But a little note on that photograph says, uh, black baby born before him. <laughs> and so um, that unnamed uh, black baby uh, born in 1860, uh, you know, would have been born to parents who lived here um, and, and probably a small community. Interesting. So now, um, can you just explain who the sappers are and what motivated them to come here? Yeah, the sappers are the Royal Engineers. They're the ones who uh, build whatever the army needs built. Um, usually they build trenches and fortifications and things like that, uh, but they, they came to British Columbia on the appeal of Governor Douglas to establish a capital. Um, and it was strongly felt that if a capital wasn't established on the mainland, then that concern about the Americans simply settling and taking over was really the big drive for why that happened. And so in 1858, 1859, the city was built by the sappers who literally um, cut it out of the forest you know, laid out all of the streets for the future capital, um, established some of the early buildings, established government house, which was located around where the former woodlands are now along Columbia Street. And they, they built a city, they laid it out, cut down the trees, built the roads, um, and that's how it started. Now, where, where was that city exactly? Was it more in the Sapperton area or did it extend all the way from, you know, what we consider downtown uh, east? Yeah, so it's, it's actually everything we know today except for Connaught Heights and a, a, tiny, a tiny little bit of other areas. But uh, Colonel Moody, who is the commander of the Sappers, uh, actually laid out a plan uh, of what the city should look, look like. And so there was a design on a map, they, they laid it all out and then they built it accordingly. So, so that space that we know, um, you know, between, between 20th Street to the end of Sapperton and the river to 10th Street, that was all laid out and built at the same time. Wow, wow, they, they certainly had vision, didn't they? <laughs> it was a big problem when the capital was moved out of New West. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Explain why was it that uh, this area was chosen to be the capital? Uh, because it's on a hill uh, and it's on this side of the river um, and it's relatively close to the entry of the river. Uh, so New Westminster was built because it was a good place to defend in terms of geography. Um, and so that famous hill that we all know and love when we walk up from the SkyTrain uh, that was the reason why the city was here. Right. And so what was the expectation in terms of who would come and settle in the city? I mean, obviously they didn't want Americans particularly. So uh, how did they go about impressing on people that maybe they should come? There were actually agents who worked in England who tried to get people to come. Um, the, there were uh, mostly Americans at the start. Um, I think that first summer about 10,000 Americans came. That was our first wave of immigrants. And you can imagine 10,000 people from May to June arriving up the river. The city doesn't exist yet. And they're on everything. They're on steamships. They're on homemade rafts. They're on little boats with paddles. They're coming up the river to get the gold uh, from the gold rush in any way imaginable. And so there winds up being about 50,000 Americans. Um, and the biggest, the biggest holidays in New Westminster for decades were uh, Queen Victoria's birthday and the 4th of July. They were both major holidays. Um, but the colonial officials, they, they tried to recruit more people through California, um, uh, to be honest, who had not been born um, as Caucasian Americans. And so there were a lot of people coming from California who had come from all over the world to the California gold rush and then and then uh, moved on moved on up to British Columbia 
In fact, the first city directory for New Westminster is actually the city directory for New Westminster in San Francisco. Really, isn't that fascinating? So in a way that the city was founded on the whole idea of diversity. Yeah, much more than people realize. Um, you know, that colonial history, the role, role of the Royal Engineers, all of the building um, that they did, you know, that's well-known history, it's well-documented, but right from the beginning, this was a, a port city, a multicultural city. Um, it was the gateway to all of, all of British Columbia, except for Vancouver Island. Okay, so, um, so there was a, the gold rush happened, and I, I guess a lot, that was the time that this city probably was settled as kind of a, a jumping off point for heading into the heading off to the gold fields. Is that, that correct? That's right. Uh, it, it was booming business in the city to prepare people to head off to the gold fields. And uh, it was also um, in those first couple of winters, it was also where all the refugees arrived uh, because the Americans from California would fail to properly prepare for the winter. And then when winter came, uh, there would be a migration back to New Westminster from the interior. So now there's a lot of heritage homes around um, New West. Um, did, did any stand out from that period that, uh, that you know of that say something about, uh, you know, the city and who was here? We don't know as much about multicultural groups and, and heritage houses as we would like. I think that's something that, that will come, but there'll be need to be changes to how research can be done in British Columbia. Uh, we do know that Irving House is, you know, the earliest surviving house in New Westminster. There's, there's a little bit of dispute about that, but Irving House is the oldest surviving house. And, um, you know, quite the, quite, Quite simply, it was a case of a very successful steamship captain um, who, and, and so that really actually speaks, you know, when you drive past it, it looks like a big old house, but it actually speaks to that successful river history of people migrating, people moving, all that activity that was happening on the river. When did the gold rush um, kind of end or peter out? It went to about the mid mid 1860s, you know, when it petered out, it, it resulted in, in a real depression in New Westminster. Uh, did a lot of people then leave the city? Yes, a lot of people left there, you know, pe there were uh, lots of owned by people who simply abandoned them. Uh, there were people who went to Victoria, there were people who went to other places. Um, the other thing that happened in the mid 1860s was that the Civil War ended. Um, and so people who had been avoiding the Civil War were now uh, ready to go back to the United States. And that included a lot of uh, black people who uh, saw some hope and opportunity in the end of the Civil War and emancipation. Um, and a substantial part of British Columbia's black population of the day went back to the United States at that time. Aha. Uh -huh. So what became the next thing? Like, was it logging, fishing? What, what was it that brought people back or brought people to, not back, but brought people right. to this area? Part of it was set up just a growing uh, population settling on land um, without much regard to whose land that might have been originally. Um, and so, you know, you started to have a farm economy that started to need service and import goods and equipment and that sort of thing. Um, but a really big part of it was fishing. And in the, in the fishery, you had uh, originally very multicultural. Um, eventually, civic officials started to limit who could get licenses based on their racial origins, but fishing was pretty big. Yeah. So when you say it was multicultural at that point, um, who would have come? Would have the Japanese come at that early? Would the, what about the Portuguese? What, you know? Yeah, so native people, of course, are a big part of the early fishery um, and Japanese people. The first, the first Japanese person to arrive in British Columbia, we actually know who that was. He arrived in the port of New Westminster. His name is Manzo Nagano. Uh, he was a sailor who just decided to jump ship. We don't know why he decided to jump ship, but there were no laws against it. 
So in 1877, Manzo Nagano came to New Westminster um, and fishing became a really big part of the economy, both, both fishing boats and the canneries. Um, we never had anything like uh, a little Japan in, in New Westminster, but we did have some, some areas. Queens, Queensboro was an area where a number of Japanese people settled, um, where the current Kruger paper factory is now. Um, there was once bunk houses of Japanese workers serving the, the local mill and canneries there. So, it, you know, it was, it was a pretty big deal. If you, you probably could not have really found anyone in the Japanese community who wasn't somehow connected to fishing other than some merchants. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, and of course the Aboriginal people were still fishing, I would imagine. And, and was, uh, were they teaching um, people how to, you know, fish in these waters or did everybody just bring their own uh, fishing technologies and techniques, you know, that from their original place? Uh, they mostly brought their own fishing techniques and technologies, but they would have had to learn about the patterns of the salmon runs and things like that from local local First Nations people. And I understand the salmon runs were huge in those days. In fact, when we were doing the documentary on the Burnett River, I understand there was like oh, thousands and th tens of thousands of fish would go up that river every year. <laughs> People have written that you all you had to do was dip your hand in the water and grab a fish. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And and was there in fact a big settlement of the Aboriginal people um, at the um, uh, mouth of the Burnett River? Yeah. So the the archaeological relics I mentioned they don't tie into a continuous community that was there at the time. Um, but an Im important thing to understand is that it was the river that was the center of life. Um, I have a friend who is a chief of abandoned Chilliwack and I actually said to him once, you know, have you ever considered river claims and not just land claims? Because that was the center of economy. It was the center of life. Uh, people had permanent villages, but there were also seasonal migration and seasonal settlements all up and down the Fraser River. So there's probably not very many places along the Fraser River that haven't had some First Nations original inhabitants at some point. For things like berries, as well as the fish, uh, people just went up and down the river as they needed to, to exploit the resources. Yeah, it's amazing how much has been lost, isn't it? Um, so now when did uh, the Chinese and the uh, Sikh population arrive? Was that in the early 1900s? Well, the first, the first documented Chinese in British Columbia are actually 1788, who were uh, workers on fur trade ships. Um, in terms of the, a real migration, that would have been the gold rush. Um, there was a large number of people of Chinese descent who were participating in the California gold rush. And a large community of Chinese people was established fairly quickly, but but coming out of California. And then we had, uh, you know, as early as, as 1860, uh, Juan Kamyao, uh, who, by the way, I successfully nominated for the $5 bill. I, I imagine there are other people, lots of other people who had the same idea, but he's one of the finalists. Uh, Juan Kamyao was born in the interior of BC in 1860. Um, he would later be a prominent individual in New Westminster. So that's when the community was really established. And New Westminster had, uh, some people call it a small Chinatown as a group of businesses along Front Street. Um, and, and then Chinatown, which kind of started around where we now see 8th and Columbia and then went up to um, roughly up to Royal Avenue and over to 12th Street. And that was that the Chinatowns, at what point were they kind of established? The, uh, the one on Front Street, almost, almost from the beginning um, of the city. Um, and I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember the date um, for what became the actual Chinatown, but it would have been quite early in the city's history. Different than, no different than the Europeans and Americans in terms of timeline. Okay. And I would imagine they were um, uh, subject to uh, quite a bit of prejudice and so on. 
um, intensely. Um, and it, it built up over time and actually got worse. So, um, you know, we in New Westminster, uh, the city has formally apologized. We had a re reconciliation process, formally apologized for historic racism. Um, and we had our staff, our museum staff and library staff review the city's record and produced a full document, you know, um, that the city had a very active role to play. So um, things like, you know, that in the early days of the city, the heavy equipment that was available belonged to the city and businesses would lease it. So uh, New Westminster at one time said, well, if you employ Asian labor, we won't lease you any of our equipment. Wow. Uh, so you can imagine how powerful that kind of thing was. Um, mm -hmm. The Chinatown was largely um, not serviced. In fact, there are records of city council meetings where people from Chinatown go to city council meetings and they say, you know, can we have the street lights? and the sidewalks the same as everybody else. Um, so we had those delegations uh, while at the same time people were, <coughs> excuse me, people were complaining about the conditions of Chinatown. They're also denying any improvement. Uh, there was the head tax. Um, I'm not sure when that, if that was. I know that, was it Mackenzie King who put in the opium laws and that was really directed mm -hmm. at the Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you recall when all that happened and what, what the impact was on the Chinese population here? Yeah, the uh, attack came in in 1885. Um, it had become much more difficult for Chinese people to work and make a living successfully, including Chinese businesses. Um, and, and so there was actually a lot of the uh, out-migration of, of Chinese people and people of Chinese descent leaving leaving. And so at one time, there was about uh, 1,500 Chinese men in the province and 53 women. And that was the, that was really the effect of the head tax of people just not being able to afford to bring family over with them. I see. Yeah. Were there opium dens? Was that part of the, uh, the leisure activity of, of, of the men? And is that what, um, gave uh, King the idea to put in opium laws? Yeah, we, kn we know there was opium use. Uh, we know there was opium use in New Westminster. Um, and like you say, there are various recreational things, and most notably alcohol itself, um, that could have been regulated, but the focus was on opium. And it, it, was, it was part of a general scare. It, it was part of representing um, Asian people as scary and dangerous. Um, and so the focus on opium wasn't so much because of its uh, harsh impact on individuals or society. The focus on opium was because this was seen as one of the scary things um, that's involved with Asian people and, and therefore it, it must be contained. I see, yeah. So was there, was there any kind of like outright riots or violence against the Chinese people in New West that you're aware of? No, there wasn't, but it's an interesting comment because uh, there were in Vancouver. Um, in 1887, anti-Chinese riots it, it destroyed the area that had become Chinese settlement. About 300 people's homes completely destroyed. Um, and in 1907, there were very significant anti-Asian riots affecting Chinese and Japanese in the city. And so New Westminster actually maintained a large Chinatown and a large Chinese population for a long time uh, because it was seen as a more desirable and safer place to live than Vancouver. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean there wasn't all kinds of systemic and legally sanctioned racism, but in the context of of activity in Vancouver that was essentially pogroms against Asian people uh, is one of the main reasons why New Westminster maintained a large community for a long time. Uh -huh. Now, uh, you said the city apologized to the Chinese and there was also, I think, a plan with that to develop a small park and, and mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, what, I, there's something about old man's building I don't really understand. Can you tell me a little bit about what, what the plan is, was? <laughs> Yeah, there's a small small park on Agnes Street um, near the SkyTrain. Um, 
and that was developed in consultation with, with various organizations that represent Chinese people, or Chinese or people of Chinese descent. Um, and that was the site of what in the 1970s was called the Chinese Old Man's Hospital. It was operated by the New Westminster Chinese Benevolent Society. And it had actually played a lot of roles. Um, it had become an, an old man's home, but before that it, it operated as a school, it operated as a community center. Um, and so it, it really was a center of the Chinese community in Westminster. Um, and in 1977, that property was donated to the city. Um, and the city really uh, didn't do anything with it for a long time. So it became an empty lot, um, largely forgotten about. And then, um, and, it, and, they, and then it was sort of rediscovered. Um, I, remember, I remember being in the city archives at the time and I was writing my book about St. Mary's Hospital and I wanted to write a little bit about every hospital that had ever existed in New Westminster. And so I walked into the archives, completely different staff of today, you know, but I walked into the archives and I said, oh, where's the archives from the New Westminster Chinese Benevolent Society? And, I kind of got a blank look of what do you mean? Um, and then people did a search and then they said, well, it's all in Chinese, you wouldn't be able to use it. And, you know, which I thought, well, I have friends in the history, history community, but I actually do know a little bit of Chinese. So I said, I'll take a look at it. And sure enough, there were notations of what, what was going on. People were fundraising for the civil war in China. People were fundraising for the war effort in Canada. People were repatriating um, the bodies of the dead because it was the custom to be buried back in your home community in China. So it was a very active organization. In 1977, that property was donated to the city. Um, eventually, um, mostly un unawares of the history of the property, it became a dog park. And then um, there was some greater understanding and knowledge of the history of that site. And it's now a, a, a park. So where is it exactly on Agnes Street? It's if you walked out of the New Westminster Skytrain station. Is it right across from the um, uh, uh, right across from Peter Julian's office and the, and yeah, the, the that large? Is, that yeah. is correct. Oh, okay, yeah. I know where you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's not a dog park anymore. They turned it into um, a kind of a memorial park. Correct. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I better go take a look. That's great. Um, so did, the, did uh, any of the Chinese people um, participate in First World War as soldiers um, from here? They, there, there were some, but we don't, they're very, very few because they weren't allowed to. Oh. oh. And in fact, in, even in, up to World War II, Chinese people were we're not allowed to serve in most roles. In World War II, you could join the military, but um, you know we had two people who were pilots. They piloted airplanes. They grew up and lived in New Westminster, and they wanted to join the Air Force and fly planes. Um, but the policy of the day was, you know, they could they could join, but they weren't allowed to fly planes. Um, so so there were those kinds of blocks uh, on military service. So when we did, you know, we still have some Chinese veterans alive today. We had veterans come to the formal apology. It was part of the apology made by New Westminster. Um, uh, but, but, but they do, you know, people do have memories of wanting to play a greater role and offer service and, and uh, only being allowed uh, at the most basic level. Uh, so did a lot of the Chinese people then move from New West? Was there sort of a, a kind of a, a migration out of the city? Uh, there was, but it was slow. Um, and eventually, uh, Vancouver, long, you know, long after the anti Asian riots were done, Vancouver just became the bigger city. It had the bigger Chinatown, and it, it just became a, a more compelling place. Now, what about the uh, Punjabi people? There may have been uh, Sikh people in the very early days of the province, but we don't know that, but we know that there was a migration in the early 1900s. And in our area, most of that centered around the Fraser Mills and people who worked at the Fraser Mills. 
did most of that population settle on on Lulu Island at Queensboro area or? Yeah, Queensboro was the center. Um, before there was a temple, before there was a Gurdwara, there was a man um, who used his own home in Queensboro as a center of worship. And so, um, in fact, we know where it was. It was at 344 Boyne Street. So uh, that, was, that was an early congregation. And then in 1919, that was formalized. And Khalsa Dewan Society was formed. And the work of building the first Gurdwara uh, happened in 1919. Did they have yeah. experience a lot of prejudice? Did they mostly work in the lumber industry? Did that shift over time? <laughs> The, the major employer was the lumber industry, even up until recent times. The government of British Columbia at that time um, probably was at the height of organized legislated racism in British Columbia. It was in the early 1900s. Um, and so the government of Canada was pressured um, to stop Indian uh, migration uh, but the government of Canada couldn't do that because Canada was still a part of the British Empire. Citizens of the British Empire were citizens everywhere in the British Empire, e even in the self-governing dominions. And so what Canada did was create a $200 immigration fee um, for, for people migrating from India. And you can imagine what $200 was like in 1908 um, for a migrant coming for work. Uh, it, you know, it was really prohibitive. So, so there was that effort early on. There, there was uh, in 1913, a ship called the uh, Panama Maru arrived at the port. It was blocked by immigration officials, but there was a court case launched. Uh, and the court in British Columbia ruled that the 38 passengers on board that ship could arrive in British Columbia. They had a legal right to arrive. There was nothing in the Immigration Act to prevent it. And that's when Canada then revised its Immigration Act, um, largely ignored its international commitments um, and decided that it was really gonna make it very difficult. So uh, we had the Kamigato Maru incident in 1914. Um, a lot of people think it was just a case of a ship arrived and it was turned back by a mob at the port, but it's actually more complicated than that. The, Kamagato Maru was actually a chartered ship to bring people to British Columbia to test the law, to try to force the issue. Um, and so there were people here in New Westminster, uh, you know, who have grandparents. I've, I've met some of them who have grandparents who were involved in that effort of the Kamagato Maru coming to British Columbia. And we know that the Kamagato Maru was eventually sent back and the aftermath was very tragic. The aftermath was uh, the ship was only provisioned by the Canadian government after a lot of dispute over who should provision the ship to return. It was only provisioned to go to Hong Kong. Um, so there was fundraising, but there was, there was struggle in getting back to India. There were people who left port in Japan and Hong Kong. Um, and when people got back to India, World War I had broken out. Um, and in fact, there was an incident uh, where 20, 20 people of the Komagata Maru were massacred in India in an incident shortly after, after returning home. So that, you know, that, in this, that, that incident in particular is very key to the history of racism that, uh, that uh, Sikh people faced in British Columbia and anyone, anyone from India, but predominantly the Sikh community. So there was always an organized response in the community, right? There were always efforts to organize in the community, to confront racism. Um, the immigration official who was behind the Komagato Maru uh, incident was himself killed um, by, by Bishan Singh. Um, but what the, what the government had been doing was terrible. They had a network of spies who would go to the Gurdwaras, go into the community, spy on people, learn who might be in the country illegally, learn how people might be trying to get into the country. They would disrupt the temples. Um, and so the, you know, there was this little network of informants run by the Immigration Department of Canada. Um, 
and uh, an incident broke out where one of the informants uh, killed some people in a temple. Um, and that people knew, they understood there were informants among them. Um, and so that triggered the reaction where the immigration official, Canadian immigration official himself was shot and killed. Uh -huh. And I actually uh, was just uh, listening to a video that the museum put on that the, um, the person who killed that immigration official is, is lauded in that community. Yeah, that is uh, Bai Bishan Singh. Um, he is allotted in the community. Um, you know, there, this, this was something I gave some thought to. Um, you know, there are people who are asserting, well, this was a murder. This was a murder of an immigration official, right? Um, but among people from India at the time, you have to put this in the context of this was the British Empire. Um, Canada was a part of that empire and there was resistance in India to the British Empire and to British authorities. And so it's a, really in that context that the local community was seeing the incident. Um, and so by Bishan Singh, when he shot that immigration official, he was seen as one of those people who was resisting the, the British Empire and the, the tyranny of the British Empire against, against people uh, in India. And and, you know, I would make a comparison to say that, you know, among my own Irish ancestors, you know, there are people who resisted the British Empire. Sometimes they did so with violence. Um, and they're lauded as the people who freed, who ultimately freed the country. And there were really strong connections. If people don't generally know this. There were really strong connections between the Sikh community in New Westminster in British Columbia and the um, Sikh communities and the movement to emancipate in India. Oh, isn't that interesting? But it makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, wasn't there some kind of mu mutiny in India around the late 1800s, if I remember? Yeah, I do uh, know. Actually, it was the Indian mutiny was really hugely serious. Um, it broke out partly as a pay dispute and it broke out partly over the right to wear uh, one's own religious or traditional clothing while serving for the British. But there were other issues like um, low food rations and things like that. And the Indian soldiers who had been serving uh, for Britain um, got massively fed up with what was happening. And it was an all out mutiny right across the country. Right. And then we're just, I've just recently found out uh, listening to one of uh, Malcolm Gladwell's revisionist history that Churchill hated the Indians and he caused 3 million Bengalis to die because he wouldn't release food that he had plenty of and he had plenty of ships available. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of another story of kind of this British um, uh, colonial view. Mm -hmm. of non-whites, which is uh, deplorable, really. Churchill's views of everybody from the Irish to the native native people to um, India, Churchill, Churchill's views were um, very colonial. So what about the Punjabi people? How were they, uh, any clashes, any... How, how did prejudice manifest against them, aside from the head tax, which you mentioned? Yeah, um, the community was smaller. Um, so the attention of government wasn't as focused on the Sikh community. Um, the Sikh community worked for employers who wanted to employ them. Um, so government didn't play a big role in that. You know, there certainly was uh, popular and local prejudice that was very strong. Um, there was that immigration fee that uh, lasted for a long time. Uh, it wasn't the same as a Chinese head tax, but there was an immigration fee if you were coming from India that lasted for a very long time. And even going up to um, modern times, you know, the 1980s, the 1990s, you know, Sikh people were fighting for the right to wear a turban, first of all, in the RCMP. And then in the Canadian military, um, and you had these situations where people who had served in the military, 
in World War II or who had served in the military in Britain or India uh, could not do so in Canada because there was a religious requirement to wear the, wear the turban and cover one's head. So, you know, that kind of lack of response and accommodation uh, was pretty strong. Uh -huh. Now, what about um, uh, any influx of other European or Eastern European um, people into this area? New Westminster still function as sort of the entryway port city to the mainland for a long time. Um, and even when that was really slowing down in the 1950s, 1960s, then New Westminster became the place uh, that had a decent number of apartments and relatively cheap rents. Mm -hmm. um, and so it became a favorite place for, for immigrant groups to come. Um, and so you had, for example, uh, and so you do see waves of people, uh, partly depending on what's going on around the world. So mm -hmm. when the uh, former Yugoslavia broke up and we had the pretty vicious warfare that happened there, there were, there were waves of uh, immigrants who arrived in New Westminster from that community. And it was fairly evident, um, strongly East European, Bosnian, Croatian kind of communities uh, so that's that's always that's always happened, and you know, and we have not Europeans, but we have the Sudanese who arrived in largely in a refugee situation in in some significant numbers. Uh, we had uh, Scots. Um, we had the Highland clearances. Uh, for people who don't know what the Highland clearances are, it's basically that the Lords of Scotland decided it was more profitable to have sheep on their land rather than people. And so they were getting the people off of their land who had lived there for millennia um, and paying for people to go elsewhere. Um, and a lot of that was Canada. So in Canada, in New Westminster, there were people who were organized and actually making trips to Scotland to try to help people and help people come over to the city. So um, there was one point where about 20% of New Westminster was Scottish. You would have heard a Scottish accents everywhere you mm -hmm. went. Mm -hmm. When were the Highland Clearances happening? The Highland Clearances started in the late 1800s and then the, uh, uh, the, the, the effect of the continued migration and social impact happened um, you know, through the early 1900s. Just to step back a little bit, um, the Japanese internment camps, of course, happened in the Second World War. So were there quite a few Japanese that were dislocated from uh, New West? Um, there were. Um, I don't know the number, but it, it, it was every, every person of Japanese descent. It didn't matter if your great great grandparents were the ones who settled in British Columbia, you were of Japanese descent, you were caught up. You know, it, it, it was very organized and systemic and complete. Um, so the Japanese fishing boats, they were all seized. There's a, actually a famous photograph of all those fishing boats gathered in one place on the river just outside of New Westminster. Businesses were seized, you know, private homes and then sold off in fairly short order. Internment was divided between Buddhists and Christians went to different oh. camps. Oh. I've, actually, I've actually visited the site where uh, Buddhists in New Westminster were taken, which is Rocky Creek, British Columbia. It's near Selmo. It, just an, it was an abandoned gold mine town and the government thought, oh, oh we could use this place for, uh, for settlement. Um, and Greenwood, Greenwood, British Columbia was a place, uh, people went to different camps and Greenwood, British Columbia was a place where a large number of Japanese people went um, Greenwood was a little different. Um, most communities did not want these internment camps. They did not want them um, out of a combination of, of racism and fear. Um, Greenwood was different. Uh, Greenwood actually is a city who said, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take these people in. We would like to offer to do that. And Japanese people who were in internment camps in Greenwood, um, the city just allowed people to come in the city to shop and 
which was not going on in other internment camps. Um, and so after the war, uh, there's a significant Japanese population, a large proportion of which was actually from New Westminster that continued to live in Greenwood. Cities were asked, they got a letter from their provincial government. Um, we're going to have all of these Japanese people being freed from internment. Um, would you take some into your city? And many cities would just stayed silent on the issue. Some cities like Victoria decided, no, we don't want any Japanese people returning. And Victoria actually sent a letter to every city in British Columbia uh, urging joint resistance on the matter. Um, oh, really? And it, it, the government initially had the idea they're going to deport all of the Japanese, uh, including those who had never seen Japan. Uh, and, and they started that effort. But there was actually protest. There was protest from some of the communities, from some of the cities. Um, and there were protests from people who had resisted, had been allies in resisting the internment in the first place. Um, in Delta, the police chief and the mayor started a petition against internment. So there were, there were people fighting that. And so the government backed down on the idea of forcing all Japanese people to go back to Japan, but there was still, there was still some. Um, who had been impacted by that policy when it was in place. You know, it wasn't until 1949 that a Japanese person was allowed um, to live on the coast of British Columbia. My goodness. And what about the um, population of the, you know, Japanese people here in New West? Did it, did it come back at all? It it never really it it never really came back in the same way, mm -hmm. um, you know the the population spread through the city, but it was mainly in the Queensboro area and somewhat in Chinatown. Actually, mm -hmm. by the okay. time of internment, Chinatown uh, was still predominantly Chinese, but it had become a mixed neighborhood that also included Japanese right. and Sikh people. Well, of course, we have the Nikkei Museum. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Uh, our mm -hmm. cultural center right on our borders here with Burnaby. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder whether that was kind of set, set up to kind of have people come to understand the Japanese community better. Is that, do you know anything about that? It was part of a reconciliation <laughs> process with the federal government. Okay. The federal government agreed to pay compensation and most of that was in the form of creating or supporting um, institutions for Japanese Canadians. Uh, so the Nikkei Memorial Museum was a big part of that. They're a great museum. You know, if you're interested in Japanese history in British Columbia or you're interested, you're a person of Japanese descent, they have great resources. It's, a, it's an interesting museum to visit. Um, you can have Japanese food in the cafeteria if you like. And, and uh, I've, I've been there myself with people who live in British Columbia who are from Japan. Um, so it still serves as a, it still serves as a center for the community. A large a number of people in New West are Philippine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what's the when did they come and why did they come? Um, mostly in the seventies and the eighties, and I think that I think that part of that migration was simply that we're a welcoming country on the Pacific Rim. Um, part of that is the events that unfolded with the fall of uh, Ferdinand Marcos, of the dictator of the Philippines. Um, but a lot of it is, is uh, economics in that, you know, Philippine people looking to migrate to have better opportunities in life um, or simply were more welcome um, under the policies of Canada than, say, um, the United States or Australia. Uh, it's actually not that, it's not as friendly now. Uh, now, what about the Somali group? Um, when, did, when did they come, mostly? 1990s, early 2000s. Okay. Uh, and are they still here or have they moved elsewhere? Yes, there's Somali organizations in the city. Okay. Uh, there's also Sudanese organizations in the city. Um, and so there's a, there are organized community groups, there are organized worship services, um, you know, this, this kind of thing, it, it, it's happening. It is the case sometimes that, you know, a, an immigrant group arrives in New Westminster um, 
you know, you have that first wave of migration and then people largely out migrate to somewhere else, right? Where, right. Yeah. where there's more people who speak the language or there's a religious facility right. um, available or, or, or something. But in the, in the case of those two communities, there's, uh, uh, there, there was some who migrated out of New Westminster early on, but they, they are established and they're still here. Right. And what about um, Syrian? Did, did, did uh, New West bring in many Syrians? I know the Unitarian Church, which I belong to, brought in a Syrian family, but they live in Coquitlam now. They lived in New West for a while, uh, but they didn't speak any English at all. It's so very difficult. At the height of that crisis, um, I think in New Westminster, it was about 200. It actually it was not the numbers that we were expecting in New Westminster. Um, and that's partly because there, there was a response across the country to that crisis and communities uh, everywhere were, were stepping up to try to assist Syrian refugees. So um, it was more than you expected or less than you expected? Less, it was less than we expected. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. but, it, but it was about, I think it was around, someone might correct me, but I think it was around 200 people at, during the height of that crisis. 200 people or 200 families? About 200 people. Okay, so not a lot, because a lot of them have fairly large families. And what about um, Muslim population? Is, that, that, is there any kind of mm. uh, differentiation around that? Well, we have the, uh, Mus we have the Muslim Charity Society in New Westminster. I, I, I don't know when that was established. Um, I just know it's been here a long time. And that has become, that place has become, there is prayer worship there. It's not formally a mosque, but there is some prayer worship there. Um, and that place has become a center that's used by Muslim people uh, from all kinds of different ethnic groups and countries. There's never been a mosque uh, or anything like that, but there have been cases of churches being rented for service and things like that. Right. So a lot of people in New West don't really, um, they don't really understand that it's quite a diverse community because I guess the people that one sees often in situ, you know, in the newspapers or, you know, in, in places of, um, uh, of power <laughs> uh, tend not to be, um, uh, or, or seemingly don't tend not to be of, uh, you know, diverse backgrounds. So can you just sort of give a bit of a landscape of what the population is like here? Well, the population was very diverse, almost at the beginning of the city's history. It was diverse linguistically too, even among Europeans. Um, you know, I said that mostly came from America, but a lot of those Americans had been Germans, French, you know, various languages. And then as New Westminster continued, it's, it became a port to this giant country that was created called Canada. And, and so uh, it, it was always a, a multicultural place right from the beginning. In fact, I didn't tell you about the Hawaiians. Oh, tell me about the Hawaiians. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when, the, uh, when the colony was founded, um, there was about 200 Europeans, mostly in Victoria. Um, there had been about 500 people from what was then called the Sandwich Islands. There had been about 500 people who'd lived and worked in British Columbia. Um, and that began in 1811. And it was uh, because the fur trade, ne fur trade needed labor. Um, and the ships, the, the English ships, the British ships, actually sailed around Africa, sailed to the Hawaiian Islands, and then sailed to British Columbia. That's how they got here. So. The, at that time, Hawaii was sort of a major transition point for those voyages. So they were involved in the fur trade. Um, there, there was more of them than there were Europeans. And uh, I actually did read in a newspaper article once talked about the Kanaka along the river of, of uh, New Westminster, where there was some kind of settlement. I don't know if it was permanent or temporary, but, but uh, there was an identifiable group of people. Some people think, this is actually a serious historical opinion, some people think that the term Kanak came from Kanaka. Interesting. 
Now, coming from the east, I'm not that aware of the, how the fur trade operated in the west. Mm -hmm. um, so mostly with the furs were brought in from down the Fraser River or, and that was Fort Langley, the, uh, the place where the trade happened or can you just give me a brief overview there? There was, there was different lines of trade um, for the British trade uh, before Simon Fraser it would go all the way back to Hudson's Bay before it reached a port. Um, and that would be journeys through waterways, lakes and rivers. Um, so it was a pretty long journey. Yeah, um, really. When Fort Langley was founded, that that was really the, the estate. It wasn't the first time there was a, a British fur trade on the Fraser River, but that was really the major establishment. But there had been a Russian fur trade along the coast that went as far south as California, and there had been American fur trade. And, and so uh, there were different routes. So obviously people that are kind of used to the sea and operating in the sea and, and the rivers would be um, mm -hmm. ideal, ideal people to help out in the fur trade. Yeah, there, there's uh, no doubt. Thanks very much uh, for all your wisdom and knowledge. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah, thank you. I, I enjoy this sort of thing and I like to get it out there. Thank you.